I think for me, I, I could never go back to being employed now, ever. I mean, I, I think I've rendered myself completely unemployable anyway. <laughs> but I think you do when you work for yourself. Natalie is 100% correct in her statement that once you have started working for yourself, it is really, really difficult to go back and be employed again. However, I have had guests on in the past. You can listen back through my library of episodes where people have been employed, been self-employed, then gone back and been employed again. But those are really the exceptions. And only if the companies they go back to really treat them like an entrepreneur anyway, and they have to be really special teams and small, small companies usually. So, and, and in fact, Natalie, when you listen to her story and her journey, you will realize that she was always destined to be running her own business. And although she's early on in her journey, she's made some great discoveries about herself, about the direction of her business. I think you will really enjoy her story. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Natalie. How are you today? I'm very, very well, thank you, Michael. Yeah, I'm really excited to be on the podcast. I've been really looking forward to it. Oh, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. I've been looking at your website and I love the title of your business. <laughs> it's really, really unusual. And we'll get to that eventually, I'm sure. And I want to hear all about how that name came about because <laughs> um, it's very memorable. I, I think it's really, really clever. But don't tell them yet. Don't tell them yet. We'll, <laughs> we'll get to that in a bit. So um, to get your story started uh, today, um, the first question I ask all my guests, and that is, could you tell us a little bit about your personal life? So where were you born? Um, a bit about your education, you know, where you've moved to, where you now live, um, about your family if you want to, but you don't have to. And just so everybody gets a sense of your journey in the early part of your life. Over to you, Natalie. Yeah, sure. So um, I was born in Leeds in West Yorkshire, um, but my family moved, um, thank goodness, me up to... Um, well, near the Lake District, so actually in Cumbria, but to a really, really small village there where my parents had their own business. Um, they ran a cafe slash restaurant. Nice. Um, yeah, so we um, were there until I was about 12. So sort of lots of memories of, you know, mum and dad being self-employed. They literally worked seven days a week, um, mm. evenings as well. So, um I loved growing up in a, and it was a really small village. I'm talking like cobbled streets, really quaint. Oh, it's like, wow. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful. Um, however, when I um, was about 13, um, it was when they still, they still did assisted places to go to private school. Right. As well, Tony Blair was still in power just before um, he wasn't. Um, you could still get assisted places where you could um, pass an entrance exam to go to a private school. Um, and, you know, so long as your parents were below, earning below a certain threshold, you'd get this assisted place. So mm. um, I think probably I was quite an unruly, so I was starting to show signs of being an unruly uh, teenager. So <laughs> I think my dad thought, right. At the age of 13, Natalie. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to those um, stages with my own daughter. But anyway, um, so I was um, packed off as it was to boarding school. But the boarding school was actually only 20 minutes away from my home, which sounds kind of nice because mm. you're not too far away from home. But actually, um, so much worse um, when you are close to home. Um, I was so unbelievably homesick. Um, mm. And it was just a culture shock as much as anything. I come from a very, very normal working class background. Um, so yeah, my parents are, you know, they're educated and, you know, intelligent, but um, I was suddenly plunged into this world where uh, we're just a completely different world, really, with people from completely different backgrounds. And there was a whole new 
you know, culture to get my head around, a whole sort of new vocabulary, everything. It was mm. a bit of a shock, really, and I really struggled with the homesickness. Um, so I boarded for a couple of years, and then after that, um, just went as a day a day pupil. Um, and I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't think whatever school I'd gone to, I would have been happy. I just, I think. Now that I've learned more about myself, I sort of struggle with authority. And yes. um, especially, you know, at, at that age, all I wanted to be doing was, you know, hanging out with my friends and, mm. um, you know, going to house parties and stuff like that. And looking back now, obviously, I wish I'd applied myself a bit more. But luckily, I did, um, you know, I came out with decent grades. And I am sure that that education has served me well in many ways um yes. I wouldn't want to relive it though I no. couldn't wait I did sixth form and then couldn't wait really to um enter the big wide world um I mean, you know as just to interject there I mean mm. it's not an untypical story about how people feel about the school system in this country mm. and it's not just this country it's around the world you mm. know School is such an institution, and mm. whether it's boarding school or even not boarding school, it's generally not a great experience for kids to go through this. I mean, some some love it. I, I granted, you know, I didn't love it either. I couldn't wait to get out of it, mm. and um, and you know, I, I I always see this to amaze me. I mean, there's a great talk. Um, TED Talk by a whole f his name is slipped now. There's an English kind of thought leader who talks about the education system around the world. You know how children start off as being creative in their early lives, and then we get rid of that creativity mm. when they get into school. Mm. And um, yeah, it's it's sad, but. Anyway, you managed to get out, so well done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whether it's different now, I don't know. We're not that that much further on, are we? But I know, um, sort of, when I look at the, I mean, my children are in primary school, but the secondary school that they will go to, mm. um, I just think, oh, I wish I'd had the opportunity to go there. Which sounds awful because my parents, you know, made sacrifices, and I was very fortunate to get that assisted place. And I suppose we always think, oh, what if? But um, yes, yes. yeah, certainly it was. It just seemed, you know, my particular school seemed very old fashioned, very, um, you know, very rigid um, and stuffy and <laughs> just mm. just didn't fit really with my personality at all. But it is interesting as, as the story goes on, perhaps how that's helped, you know, shape what I do today, really. I'm sure it has had an impact. But I knew that when I, um, I did sixth form and I knew that I didn't really know what I wanted to do so I didn't want to I got the grades to go to university but I knew that if I went I would just kind of waste it I'd spend three four years um doing a degree but what was the point if I didn't know what I was you know what job I wanted to do so I told myself that I would take a gap year um that gap year rather than traveling the world um ended up being getting a job as a junior estate agent I kind of thought well I'll you know, work for a while and save yes. up some money and then do the whole traveling thing. Okay. Um, but what actually happened was I got this job as a as a junior estate agent and quite liked working. Um, I liked earning the money. Yes. Um, you know, I got into a relationship at that point. So I kind of got settled at quite an, an early age, really, because um, I was only sort of 18, 19 at this point. Yes. Um, and I did quite enjoy estate agency although the first experience of working as an office junior again that was a bit of a shock entering mm. the world of work um I, again I wouldn't really want to go through that again um because looking back now I think you know I experienced bullying in the workplace but at the time I had nothing to compare it to no. I for me that was maybe this is just normal I look back now and I think oh gosh if I knew that that was happening to one of my children I'd be you know, devastated. Um, but at the, yeah, as I say, at the time, it just didn't really hit home that that's, that's what it was. Mm. Um, anyway, I stayed there a couple of years and then decided to pursue a career within a state agency and moved back down to Leeds. Because although I'd grown up in a beautiful part of the country, of course, when you're that age, you sort of think of the city, you know, the bright lights and all the rest of it. So of um, 
moved down to Leeds and um, so I did progress my career within a state agency. I, um, you know, worked for companies like Bester Weaves and Savills and for the most part I did really enjoy it. But uh, I think for me all I ever really wanted um, at that time um, was a family. All I wanted was, you know, to meet, um, you know, somebody nice, get married, have some children. Mm -hmm. You know, in my 20s, um, although I enjoyed my work and although um, I was keen to sort of progress, really all I wanted was, you know, to live in a nice little cottage in the countryside. The irony here, I'd moved down to move to the city and all I wanted to do was get back to the countryside now at this point. Yes. Uh, ridiculous. <laughs> I became obsessed with watching River Cottage with Hugh Fernley Whittingstall and dreaming of having a little small holding with my children, free range children and all the rest of it. But, oh, wow. Um, so I probably stayed in a state agency for about 10 years. And then... Um, That's quite a while, isn't it? Was it was quite a while. And I did sort of move, you know, sort of every on average probably about every two and a half years because you do move around quite a lot in the state agency so progress from being you know admin to negotiator and then to valuing so um there was a progression but then the property market the bottom fell out of it basically and I got made redundant and I think that was a good um point for me to kind of think right what what do I really want here um Mm -hmm. And as that sort of coincided with um, the relationship that I was in, um, wasn't going very well. And I actually ended up moving back to Cumbria. Wow. um, And meeting my now husband, um, settling back down in the village that I'd grown up in. Yes. Um, And then I had my two children who are now five and six. um, And obviously the first uh, few years of having them, I was just sort of focused really on um you know looking after them and you know again I was doing sort of bits of work um around the village you know and that's you know bits of cleaning helping out in the village shop mm. all sorts really just whatever you can whatever you can do but of course. um it was only really after I'd had the children that I kind of realized that I did have any ambition at all <laughs> strange really often you know most people kind of um, well, not most people, but I suppose the traditional way of doing it is to, you know, go to university, um, you know, start a career, progress that career and then have a family and maybe go back to it. But it kind of all happened the other way around for me, really. I think yes. I was so, um, I wanted a family so much that I think that kind of clouded everything and I don't think it left room for thinking about a career really because right. I was so focused on that and it's almost like a, f- a switch was flicked it's strange as soon as I had my my two children um it was like oh right I could do this and I could do that and maybe it was a confidence thing as well because once you become a mum I guess your confidence increases because you think well if I can do that I can do anything you know I'm a mum so mm. um I'm sure that was part of it but I and do, you, do you think there was something because you said, oh, you know, your interest was, you, you didn't have interest to be kind of a, have a career, but but you had children. So, I mean, that in itself is a massive career. <laughs> you it know? is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that can't be underestimated. I mean, mm-hmm. what I find is that, um, and I'm not generalising here, but mothers do sometimes kind of, and maybe it's a society, I don't know, kind of say, mm. oh, well, having children isn't really a career or, you know, isn't a job or, but it's a massive, you know, responsibility mm. and it's a lot of hard work. Actually, I believe, because it's 24-7, isn't it, that mm. you never stop. So it's actually more hard work than having a career or a job. To be definitely honest. easier going to work definitely yes <laughs> yeah and I think that I think it is a um you know part of, of our society and yeah I think everyone should just have the choice really to do what's best for them for some for some you know people it is best to 
you know, stay at home and focus on being a mum full time. For other people, that would drive them crackers. And mm. so it's better for them and their family for them to, to go back to work. But yes. I think for most of us, in my experience, when I look around me, we are all trying to do it all and we are all mm-hmm. <laughs> frazzled with it. And uh, yes, yeah, don't feel like we're doing any of it um, very well. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate and I'll sort of come on to this, but I'm fortunate in that I do have flexibility uh, with my work and I do feel that I can get a balance, but I know that for you know, 90% of the women that I know, my friends, they don't have the balance and, it's really difficult. I don't know what the answer is, really. Um, I just sort of hope for women that as the generations go on, perhaps, you know, it will get easier and there will be changes. But I think we've just, I think the society that we live in, we all have to work now really to keep up with a certain lifestyle and, and even just to house ourselves, you know, with bills and council tax and everything. Right. So I think now I- it isn't so much of a choice. It's... I saw a report recently, uh, and again, you see these headlines, but you can't remember who wrote it. Mm -hmm. Um, But the headline, and I totally concur with this, is that the future of work will mean that people will actually choose which days they want to work, Mm -hmm. how long for, and what they will be doing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So there's going to be more choice, I believe, and actually more, potentially even more, and I know that we're pretty well employed in this country, but even more employment for people because we're, people are going to just be working, you know, two days a week or three days a week to be able to fit it around their kind of lifestyle. Mm. And I think, you know, this country still has a huge amount to learn compared to the continent or some of the Scandinavian countries where they really prioritise family mm. above work. Yeah. Right? So people actually get more priority or more support with supporting their family rather than more support um, with, you know, with with work in terms of, you know, we want more out of you type of thing. Mm. And I'm... I'm I'm sorry, I don't want to take over this conversation, but just one other point to make. I'm reading this book at the moment that was written a few months ago by these guys who've been looking at the world of work in the future Mm. called, and the book's called Digital Overload. And they're they're talking about this phenomena Mm. of, and, and this may be an interesting discussion when we get onto content, but it's, you know, this world of 24-7 that everybody's on all the time and that your boss expects you to be on um, even, you know, when you're at home type of thing yeah. with your mobile phone and that, you know, people are still sending your emails at 10, 11 o'clock at night um, mm-hmm. because it's in their head. They've got their mobile there. They went, oh, I can just think of it. Oh, that's my mobile. I can just send it. No one will be looking. But yeah. of course, everybody. We all gets, are. Yeah. We are all looking, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting next decade, I believe, on how the world of work is going to change. And I believe the whole kind of family thing that we're just talking about is going to flip around for sure. Mm. I think I think things have to change, and I think there's so many different issues. But um, you know. It, <laughs> For things to change, I think, you know, men need to be able to be more flexible with their work as well. And therefore, employers need to change their outlook and perception and how flexible they are with their employees. Because, you know, again, from what I've seen, I know there are an awful lot of of men out there and dads out there, you know, doing some of the childcare and, and some are doing it full time. But yes. I know for a lot of men, they'd like to do more, but they don't feel that they can because they feel that, you know, it, it would put them back at work and it would be, you know, frowned upon. And I just think there's a whole shift that needs to take place before things are going to get any easier, really. Um, and as well, like you say, about this whole 24, 24-7 working thing, about this being switched on, it's really interesting. I've been thinking about that recently because – you know, it, it ha- happened to me last night, actually, you know, it was sort of like I was getting ready to go to sleep about half 10, quarter to 11. And I noticed an email from a client and mm. because it's on your phone, you just can't not look at it. And then that's in your head. And and I felt myself almost replying to that because I, I wanted, know. 
I wanted to get it off my, you know, out of my head, ticked off my list. Yes. And I thought, no, because then that's just making people think that it's okay for them to email you at, at half past 10 at night and that you'll get back to them. So they're going to do it again and again and again. Um, so actually I made myself wait until this morning, but um, I am actually going to look into, I was talking to somebody about this actually on my podcast the other week and they were saying that you can get plugins for sending you emails so that you can write them and schedule them, but then they're only sent, you know, so you could schedule it on a Saturday. It should just be sent on Monday morning, which I think is far more kind of respectful for the other person um because like you say although we think oh they won't be looking they won't see it we all are aren't we so that's what happens you know mm-hmm. we are, and you know i i oh it's it's probably about 80 months ago now that i stopped all the notifications on every single app mm-hmm. uh, on my phone i just stopped them all I've still got them. I mean, some I've deleted because I will only look on my desktop. Uh, I won't look on the app. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I've, I've stopped being active on Facebook. I stopped being act- I've come off Instagram. I've come off uh, WhatsApp. And, and that's a whole other story because that's Facebook type products. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I also switched off all my notifications. So even my email notifications, I don't get any at all. So it's only when I go into my email Mm. that that I decide when I want to look at my email. Mm. So I won't be looking at it all night until, you know, kind of work time in the morning. Yeah. And it takes discipline, doesn't it? Well, to begin with, because we're all conditioned. You're right. We're all conditioned by it. And therefore, the habit has to break at some stage. So you have to be brave and go, right, I'm going to switch my notifications off. And then Mm. you have a little bit of withdrawal for a few days. But once you're about 48, 72 hours into it, you kind of go, oh, my God, I'm free. I'm free. (laughs) You know, I I decide when to look. The app doesn't decide when I look. Mm. Because we're all drawn to that little red dot with the number on it, we kind of go, oh, my God, I've got four emails. Let me have a look what it is. Mm. And, you know, three of it might be junk even. Um, So it's very, I mean, we could have a huge discussion on this whole topic on its own, but (laughs) it, it is important because, you know, people that are working and are in employment are very stressed out. Mm. They believe that actually working on your own is an easier option. Well, we have news for you, it's not. (laughs) Um, However, there are different disciplines that even when you're self-employed, working for yourself, you've got to put into place. Mm. Um, Anyway, we we digressed a little bit there, so... uh, (laughs) So you're you're kind of on this crossroads of right. I could have a career now that the kids are grown up a little. Mm. Yeah, and it's. I think a lot of people say this. It, it didn't happen by accident, and I didn't exactly fall into it. But um, the path that I ended up going down wasn't the path I kind of intended to. But I'm glad I did. I basically um, thought, well. I I need to sort of craft a career here because I knew that I didn't want to go back to being employed. It just had never really suited me. (laughs) And um, so I've always loved, I did actually end up doing a degree when the children were babies, actually, as you do, um, (laughs) with the the Open University. And I did it in English literature. Um, So I thought, right, well, what am I going to do now I've got this degree? And I thought, well, I I love words. I love reading. Um, So I actually joined the Society for Editors and Proofreaders and um, did some courses on proofreading and copy editing. Oh, yeah. And then once I got those qualifications, I set myself up freelance and started doing, um, you know, some work for publishers, mainly fiction novels and that kind of thing. And then um, one day a friend of mine, um, she runs her own business and she just had a website done and written her own copy. And she said, would I mind proofreading it for her? Which, of course, I did, you know, for nothing. And she said, "Um, 
I'm a member of this forum on Facebook. Um, so her business, it's really random. Her business is a bounty castle and soft play business. Right. And basically anybody in the UK who owns bounty castles and soft play equipment is part of this particular Facebook group. Right. So my friend put a recommendation on there, said, um, you know, Natalie Haley has proofread the copy on my website, can highly recommend if anybody else is uh, looking for their copy to be proofread. And from there, sort of a stream of, of inquiries started coming through. Right. And I was like, okay, well, I may as well, you know, do this. It was, you know, quite easy for me to do around the children. So sort of started off doing that. And then, you know, as the weeks went on, people would say, well, I'm actually, would you be prepared to write some copy for us? You know, we need descriptions for all of these different bouncy castles and for our homepage and about page and writing just isn't our forte. Would you be interested? And I was like, well, I've always loved reading and writing, so I'm happy to dip my toe in. So started doing that for a while and it turned into a little business, really. Mm. Um, and I actually teamed up with um, a close friend of mine. We actually worked together for a year. Um, doing this specifically because she was um, really strong in the sort of um, she's very techy and she was really up on search engine optimization and all the rest of it. So I would write the copy and she would optimize it and help people, you know, with the websites and optimize the websites. So we made a little business out of it, really. But yes, I knew that I didn't want to be doing that forever um because you know it's you know there's only so many times you can you can write about bouncy castles but I think what it did was made me realize that actually there were people out there who needed um words and um didn't have the confidence to to write themselves and um that there was you know the potential for some form of business so um I set up hot content two and a half years ago um really just intending to provide blog content for companies because I thought well um you know many companies business owners will be the same as these people who had the bounty castle business will need content but don't have the time or the inclination necessarily or the skills to write it um so started off just providing blog content for companies um And then it just kind of developed really quite organically. It's funny, you can have all these plans for what you think a business is going to look like and what you're going to do. And then it decides for you and you end up doing something quite different. So it's really evolved over time. Um, I suppose before I go into what I do, I, I suppose I thought I need to, I suppose deciding to do the copy I didn't improve reading and then trying out this this business copywriting business mm. was all part of this realization that if I wanted a particular kind of life so where we live in Cumbria it's probably one of the most expensive places in in the country right. so it's really difficult to get onto the property ladder so at this point we weren't we were renting I thought if I want to be able to um you know go on holiday every year if we want to buy a house we have to make we have to be the ones to drive that because one thing I've realized is that I know it's a cliche but you have to make things happen and a career just doesn't suddenly come and land in your lap and say hey pursue me and you know I'll turn things around for you and create a great lifestyle you almost have to decide the kind of life that you want and make it happen um so I suppose this was the beginning of that, really. I'd, I'd gone through sort of these 10 years of thinking, I want this kind of life, you know, um, but always kind of, yeah, just just struggling through, really. Um, and so so this was the beginning of that journey for me of like, right, let's make this happen. So, um, yeah, so set up the business. Um, and it was fantastic working with a friend as I had done for that roughly a year. Um, it's great sort of being in partnership with somebody because you always have that other person to rely on and you can bounce ideas off each other and you've got that moral support for things. But equally, I think I was ready to to go it alone because there are also lots of other advantages of being on your own in terms of, you know, the, all the decisions that you make are yours. You don't have to run things by anybody else. Um So I embraced all of that, really. And I think it was only really when I went on my own and and developed hot content that um, I sort of came into my own with it, really. And things kind of started to really take shape. 
Um, so as things progressed, you know, I, I started doing some of the blog content and working with companies, a lot of companies who had their website created, but didn't necessarily want to write the copy for it. So I do quite a lot of web content and that was all fine, but there wasn't a huge demand for it. Um, not as much as I'd hoped, sure. um, whether that was because I think when you first start out, it's easy to, well, in some cases it makes sense to, but you you do go to networking events in your local area and you do try and focus on your local area to try and get a bit of a foothold. Mm. Um, where where I live, obviously, um, Cumbria, it's very tourism related. Um, there isn't a huge amount of, of large companies with a big budget, basically, to um, to spend money on having somebody create content for them and all the rest of it. So, yes. yeah, I think that's probably one reason why there wasn't huge, huge demand. Um, and I think in the early stages as well, I was probably a little bit mm, limited in my focus. So I was just probably – they always tell you that, that you need to have a niche. It's good to have a niche, and it is. <laughs> but um, I think maybe I was being a little bit narrow. Yes. And what would happen is that people would never really understood what I did. And so I think as well whether that's partly where I live as well, but um, a lot of people still – aren't really au fait with what a blog is so um i would try and explain what i did and they'd immediately think that it was something to do with social media which yes. you know it kind of is in that you promote your blog on social media but mm. you know as the first year went by it was just more and more people were just saying do you do social media um and i would get inquiries can you manage our social media and i would always be like well, that isn't what i do um right. And I was just coming up against this all the time. And I think eventually they ground me down. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> I've been doing my own social media. I've become quite confident with it. I don't think I'm bad at it. Um, do you know what? I'm just going to give it a go. So I started working with my um, first client, um, helping them with their social media. And I thought, actually, I, I do quite enjoy this. And actually, um, what ended up happening was that I kind of became a little bit more open minded about the type of clients that I worked with and the type of work I did. And it, like, like I say, the business kind of decided for me what it was going to be. So um, what's kind of ended up happening over the last two and a half years is that Yes, I do work with some clients on their social media, but it's always as part of a wider package that includes blog content. Um, so uh, to me, with with sort of marketing, online marketing and content marketing, you can't just take the one approach. So you can't just focus on your social media. You've got to have a great website to drive people to from your social media. You've got to have a great blog on there. Um, you know, if you've got a podcast, you need to also drive people to that from your social media. So, you know, it all works together. You can't just focus on one element on its own. And what I found now by taking on the social media work is that I can help people with their blog, podcast, whatever it is, um, because I'm also working on their social media, I can kind of work on on their their online marketing as a whole, if that makes sense, which has been yeah. really good. So it's it's really interesting listening to you speak and recounting how where you you know started with you know Bansy Castles and soft toys or whatever. Uh, and doing a bit of copywriting there mm. for their websites to realizing actually there's perhaps a little bit more to this. Mm. Okay, a bit of blogging content because that, you know, kind of fits with where you started with it. And then looking at content, online content mm. as a bigger piece that actually, you know, it all needs to be joined up across mm. the piece, not just a blog in its own right or a podcast in its own right or social media and it's, it all just needs to be joined up and some strategy around it. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. It, that's, it's the strategy mm. that pulls it all together. And I think I was – I joined quite a lot of marketing communities, which is one of the best things I ever did because I just think you meet such great people, helps get your name out there, means you can collaborate with fantastic people, and you learn such a lot. Um 
and but one thing that really came out of that was was this whole thing about work out who you are what you do what your niche is and I think perhaps I was focusing too much on one particular service yes um but I think it you know I think it's the same for anybody when when you first start out as I say you you can have this idea of what you think that people want and actually it takes time to develop a niche and to and I'm still working on mine. I'm still nowhere near being niche enough in a lot of respects. But um, well, is is it niche in terms of what you do, or is it niche in terms of the clients that you'd like? Do, do you know mm, what I'm saying? Yeah. So what I see a lot is that, and I've had this problem with myself for many, many years, mm. and that is actually identifying who your ideal client is mm -hmm. you know um and i guess to a certain degree you've got to do that when you're writing content right mm. you've for, when you're helping a client you've got to have some idea of that you know persona avatar or whatever of the person who's going to be reading it mm. um and I know we can all say, well, anybody, you know, it's anybody, but actually we can't work with everybody. There's like 7 billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we, we, we do need to, I think, have a better view. And I struggled with this and I'm still, you know, identifying who is my kind of target client and what is their avatar or their persona mm -hmm. uh, and there's other terms for it but and being getting really crystal clear on on who they are so I think that's where I would suggest to listeners and and anybody in in business to say actually your offer can be quite broad mm. um I mean not ridiculous because you know, you only have so many hours in the day, but um, I think the niche comes in where you focus on that's my ideal client. Mm. And then even when you meet people who are not your ideal client, you tell them who your ideal client is because they will know somebody you mm. know, in their network that is that ideal client. And they start to think about that in that way. I mean, mm. I've you, we're both friends of Richard Tubb and... Mm -hmm. I've done that with Richard over the years. You know, if I've seen somebody and I went, that's a good contact for Richard. Mm -hmm. And and I send them to him and say, I think this may be a good contact for you or they may be a good contact <laughs> or the other way around rather. And um, often I've been, I'm not so saying I've always got it right, but it's once you know what kind of people people are looking for you can send them to them can't you absolutely and I think for me you know I got myself in such a pickle about this whole ideal client thing I mean I went to workshops I was there with a piece of paper trying to scribble down you know what age they were and you know what kind of business they had and all the rest of it and mm. yeah there is a bit of that that you need to do but actually when I look now at the clients that I have I am so I feel so privileged to work with them and I think yes. well what makes me feel like that and it's because they are all incredibly switched on they are incredibly motivated dynamic um and that makes them a joy to work with. They're incredibly open-minded. So I never have to sort of say, look, it might be a good idea to do this. Have you ever considered this? They go, what do you think, Natalie? Or I've um, I've seen that you do, you know, so many people say, oh, I've seen that you have this podcast. I'd quite like a podcast. Can you just, you know, do this and do that? And and I just think, wow, that's amazing when people are so sort of open-minded. Obviously, you don't want them to be just like, oh, yeah, do whatever, you know, and not put any thought into it. But they're basically just really switched on people who are just yes. – it's there's nothing worse than having to, you know, working with a client who you sort of advise that they need to have a blog or something. And they're like, mm, I'm just not really sure that, you know. And we have to constantly convince people that what's – what's yes what will work and what, what will be good for their business. And um, that's really, really hard. So I think what, what ties all my sort of ideal clients together and fortunately current clients together is that that kind of... Um, that's perfect. Yeah, that's mindedness perfect. and, and that's, forward thinking. Yeah. That's your ideal client, isn't it? That's yeah. your description of your ideal client. Yeah. You know, somebody who's switched on, open-minded. 
that's what you yeah. Mean. But you see, that never occurred to me, mm. you know, until I started working with those people. Absolutely. So it is hard when you first start out. I guess I just want to get that across for people because I know how I sort of felt frustrated in the early mm. stages. Um, and, and I just sort of think it's important for people to know not to worry about it too much at first and just experiment. Because for me, it was only when I became a bit more open minded myself and sort of thought, right, OK, well, I'll try working with this type of client that I realized that they were the right type of client. And sometimes you have to work with the wrong client, wrong kind of client to realize that they aren't right for you and you're not right for them. So. Mm. I think, you know, it's a balance between knowing who you are, what you offer and for who, and actually being a bit open minded and prepared to experiment and try new things as well. So, um, yeah, so so I feel like, you know, there's a lot of work still to do and I'm still in, in the relatively early stages of, of, of the business. But um I feel like I'm sort of on the right path. And I feel like I think you, you get to points as well in your business where you reach a certain level and then you're like, right, okay. And well, you know, I could just sit here for however long, but, um, I need to think about what the next, the next step is. And I think I'm going to start working with, um, a business coach next month. Um, well, this later this month. Um, and I think that's going to be really important for me because I think you get to a point where there's a few different ways you could go with something. And I think it's just, carefully considering about where you where you take your business when you get to a certain point so that that's going to be really interesting i think sounds brilliant yeah it so sounds, yeah. you know the thing is it and i know it's um corny to say it cuz you know it's it is a journey it's not a destination you're never really going to arrive mm. um but the exciting thing is that it's never the same and no. you're the one who decides where it's where you're going to take it there's nobody telling you what you mm. should you should be doing i mean even if you get a coach or a good coach they will just inspire you to look at things differently not they're not going to tell you which direction you've got to go that's going to be your decision exactly yeah but they will inspire you to look at things in a different way mm. so that you can get the answers that you're looking for yeah, definitely. And I think as well, you know, many of your listeners, as you say, will be considering going self-employed or it might be, you know, something that they would love to do in the future, but don't have the confidence. And I think, I think for me, I, I could never go back to being employed now, ever. I mean, I, I think I've rendered myself completely unemployable anyway. <laughs> um, I think you do when you work for yourself. I think it, well, you gave the clue was right at the beginning when you mm. said something about not liking authority when you were 13. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. There's been a theme, I think. A theme. I just think the relationship with your client, when, when you work for yourself and you have your own business, the relationship, when you, or how it should be anyway, when you work with your clients, it's one of mutual respect. Um Whereas, unfortunately, what is often the case when you are employed is is not always um, one of mutual respect. And mm. I think a lot of people sort of feel taken advantage of and um, feel demoralized. And, and I just think, I, I think it also depends on what type of person you are. I mean, let's face it, to be, to ha have your own business, to be self-employed, you have to be incredibly self-motivated. So if you're not self-driven and self-motivated, it probably isn't for you mm. um you know luckily I've always been quite driven in the sense of if I get something into my head if I decide I want something um pretty much <laughs> obsess about it and you know pester people <laughs> until it happens yes um you know so it's not for everybody um but I think you I think you know um when you do it it, it feel if it feels right um yeah. then yeah. Yeah, you'll, you'll never look back, basically. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, that's brilliant. And I, I, I want to ask you a question. I, I interviewed on one of my podcasts a lady in America who's a, mm. a fellow Dutch person, mm -hmm. and she runs a, a website called Dare to be Kind, and mm -hmm. it's a movement to identify uh, to be more kind, you know, in the world, to spread more kindness. 
and I I said I would ask my guests uh, a question about kindness in terms of their journey. Mm. So my question to you is, who in your career or your business that you're now running mm. on that journey showed you some kindness that really significantly helped you on your way? Can you think mm. of somebody and, and why? Yeah, there's always uh, – well, there's, there's obviously more than one, but if I had to um... – you know, pinpoint anyone. It would be somebody who, when I first set up on my own, mm. um, in the very, very early stages, um, just kind of offered me so much support from the beginning. And that's John Esperian. Um, so a lot of people know John. He's very prolific on um, LinkedIn. I actually met John on Twitter and it was actually... <laughs> He was also a member of the Society for Editors and Proofreaders. Um, so there was a little bit of connection there as well. But we we didn't really know each other from that. We just kind of, he would engage with some of my posts on Twitter when we first started out. And he was just always so encouraging. Mm. Um, he was always that sort of, he was a bit like a cheerleader, really. Wow. Um, you know, we've become good friends. Um, and I think that's so important in those those really early days because they can be dark days you know where you're kind of questioning what you're doing is this ever going to work are you ever going to get anywhere and achieve what you what you're trying to achieve should you just go back to being <laughs> being employed of course um it's so important to have people like that who show faith in you and he would always you know just come out with really lovely comments you know love what you're doing you're doing great stuff keep going you know um you need you need people like that. So yes, it would be it would be John Esperian oh, for me. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. That sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I think when you become self-employed as well, and especially if you join, you know, you get to be, meet people on social media. If you join marketing communities as well, or communities that are related to whatever your industry is, you all do support each other, um, and that's that's been one of the best things about being self-employed for me is the people that you meet. Um, you know, and the way everybody is so sort of collaborative and supportive, definitely. Fantastic. So we kind of touched on, you know, your business about content and blogging. Mm. And so I'd like to just quickly revisit and perhaps give you an opportunity to, you know, explain like in perhaps in summary mm. um, what it is that you do for people um in that respect I, I we have mentioned quite a bit of it but if you were to summarize it and then also with that um share with us you know how people can get in touch with you natalie yeah sure so if i had to kind of summarize it um i would say basically i work with um businesses or individual business owners who want to become more visible online so I will help them increase their online presence through, it can be through blogging, it can be through helping them with their podcast or repurpose their podcast, or it can be through their website content, it can be through their social media. Um, but the ultimate aim, however we decide to do it, whatever strategy we use is to help people get seen online. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, as I say, the, the type of clients that I work with, they vary, some are large organizations others are really really small business owners um but what we're trying to do for each of them is ultimately the same thing mm. um so yeah for anybody who wants to um connect with me um or find out more about what i do the website is hotcontent.co.uk and i'm on facebook as um natalie at hot content and my twitter handle is hot content uk and brilliant. And we'll share those details in the show notes anyway, so people can find you. So I did say right at the beginning, I wanted to know how the name came about, because I love the name of your business, Hot Content. So how did that come about? <laughs> that was funny, really. Um, it was literally a blank piece of paper and um, one of those, what do you call them, where you write a word in the middle and then a spider diagram or something like that mind map the mind map yeah it, it came from that um and i honestly can't remember i mean obviously it's clear to see where the content part came from but yeah. quite how the hot part ended up there i'm not incredibly sure i think literally i sat down with a friend and we were just throwing words around and sort of ended up with with that really but 
I guess, you know, it's a little bit of a buzzword as well. You do, you know, you do come across, you know, the term hot content. So mm. it just kind of seemed to fit. It's interesting because people outside of the content marketing industry are like, Ooh, hot content. What what does that, you know, they think it's a very different kind of business. <laughs> so yeah. oh, <laughs> God. When I, it's funny because whenever I tell anybody what my business is called to anybody that isn't involved in the industry, I'm always a bit like, you know, slightly embarrassed. Um, but, you know, I deal with it. And funnily enough, um, I, <laughs> Andrew and Pete, who I'm going to be working with as my business coaches, they're quite wacky with their marketing and that's how they, they stand out. They're amazing with it. But they, mm. they're always trying to get me to be more, um, make more of the hot content. But, um, you know, sort of with hot pink and, and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm always like, no, I'm just going to keep it quite tame and toned down. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Well, I do like the name. I don't know whether I don't know whether I'd whether I'd keep it forever. Who knows? But yeah, well, I think certainly... it flows quite nicely because your surname is with an H so Natalie Haley of hot yeah, content that's true yeah so I think that flows quite nicely I think you know in this day and age it's just it's memorable right mm, it is, and yeah. and you could even you know share the story about it but also perhaps my my thought process is the hot is relates to you know people being engaged mm. and when people are engaged you know their their brain lights up their brain gets hot mm. and and so if they have the right content and you can get and engage people then you know it becomes viral it becomes hot or whatever yeah i like but that yeah yeah it's it's when they you know it's like their brains on fire type of thing and mm. yeah <laughs> um, but i think it's memorable i it kind of sums up really well what you do you know and because you got content in the name people kind of can understand it and kind mm. of relate to it yeah yeah so i think yeah, well done for coming up with it. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> I really like it. I wish it. I could find it. I'll have to try and um, find the photo I've got on my phone or it'll be on my computer or somewhere. I did take a picture of that spider diagram, the mind map thing. It'd be interesting to have a look back now, wouldn't it, and see what the other options oh, were. Oh, <laughs> that would be... Because yeah. I, I notice you do quite a bit of speaking as well. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about that, actually, because we didn't talk about that. Yeah, I think for me, I was just trying to look at ways of, um, you know, getting more exposure, really. Mm. And I went to um, an online, a two day course called um, World Class Communications. It's run by Chris Marr at the Content Marketing Academy up in Edinburgh. And I went yes. to that and was just really inspired, really. And I thought, um, yeah, I'd love to I'd love to do this. And I always, when I was growing up as well, I always wanted to be an actress or a news reader. So I think, I think, <laughs> being, I think being on stage, um, kind of, you know, uh, you know, it gets that part of me out a little suits bit. Suits you. It suits you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm still very much still a lot of work to do. Um, but yeah, I've um, I've done quite a bit of it this year, and I've got some some quite exciting. Um, you know speaking gigs coming up so um I, I do enjoy it and I you know it gets me out and it gets me to meet lots of great people at conferences and things like that so um you know I tend to talk about um how people can you know create great content um but also sort of share some of my my story and, and experiences as well so yeah I enjoy it yeah brilliant so what I was, what went through my head when you mentioned that you had the picture, that mm. you know the spider diagram, and I don't know if you use slides or anything in your workshops mm -hmm. or presentations, or by yeah. way of introduction, you could always use that to say, show that, and say that's where the name came from or whatever. Yeah, uh, that that would really be cool because yeah. I think, I mean, people like to know how did people come up with the name. I mean. The name of my company, which is called Staying Alive UK, mm. um, literally the name, I swear, 
came in a dream. The name of my business came in a dream and literally with the song staying alive in my head. How amazing. And the message was, the message I got from the dream was, if you use this name, people will will always be singing the tune in their head. Um, And that's only years afterwards. And I'm a Bee Gees fan, but Mm. I didn't pick the name for that reason. But um, years afterwards, I then realized that Staying Alive is actually one of the most popular songs on the planet. Right. Um, And I went, well, I never knew that. Mm. Um, So, yeah, so, but it's often when people, when I say, you know, my that's my company name, people start singing the song. And, <laughs> you know, I've not had to do anything. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Gosh, I love that it came to you in a dream. <laughs> I literally came, I literally woke up and I could remember the dream and I went, okay, then that's the company name. Yeah. And <laughs> well, it is a good one. <laughs> um, so Natalie, I've I've really enjoyed listening to your story and getting to know you a bit and where your whole whole journey from Leeds through to the Lake District and then back to Leeds and then back to the Lake District. <laughs> and so absolutely fabulous. Definitely you're one to watch for the future, I think. Um mm. I think what you've started and created is absolutely awesome. And um Hopefully, um, I'll come and see you talk maybe one day. Let us know where you're speaking, and maybe I'll come and, and visit and say hello. Uh, oh, definitely hope to meet in you. person one day, yeah. that's for sure. Definitely, yeah. No, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. It's been great. Enjoy and success with your business. Thank you, Michael. Thanks a lot. All the best. Bye. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 